Let us resume our discussion of the history of the Jews in Israel by looking at the period of the divided kingdom. And I'd like to begin by going to another Gedank experiment, another thought experiment that really comes from an old joke. The joke goes like this. You know, this time of year, I'm recording in late October, uh, it's still dark early in the morning. So the joke goes that Ruvain comes out of his house one day and he sees down the street is his neighbor Shimon, who's rooting around in the gutter. And he goes up and he says to him, Shimon, what are you doing? Uh, and Shimon says, I'm looking for my car keys. And Ruvain says, but you live down the block. Why are you looking over here? And he and Shimon points to the lamppost and he says, well, I'm looking over here because the light is much better over here. <laughs> so the, obviously it's silly. If you're looking for your car keys, you have to look near where your car is parked. But the Gedank experiment is we we're kind of like very interested in the earliest periods of Jewish history, looking at the the sources uh, that are discussed in the Torah and Genesis and Exodus and so on, and um, it, they're really hard to find. Uh, but that's because the light over there is very dark. However, when we move down the street a little bit and we're under the light, suddenly we see so much more material. That's really what happens in the period we're going to discuss today. There's so much more archaeological evidence that confirms the narrative of the biblical text, albeit hundreds of years after the events described in Genesis and Exodus, that we're tempted to say that maybe we'll find the information we're looking for. The analogy breaks down, however, because you know, you probably would find some things in the gutter. You might find, let's say, for example, a receipt from the bakery that fell out of your pocket when you're walking into your house and the rain washed it down to the gutter. You might find, uh, you know, a loose sock that matches another one that belongs to one of your toddlers that's upstairs in the drying machine right now. You might find all kinds of connections from what's in the gutter down your street to what happens by your car. You won't find your keys directly there, but they might lead you back to where the keys are. We'll just have to wait as the archaeological uh, evidence is uncovered, literally, as uh, historians and archaeologists go to work in the land of Israel. But at any rate, let's look at some of the stuff that we can find now under the bright lights. Now, Dr. Kitchen points out very clearly that this is such a strong period compared to what we've been talking about earlier. Um, there are 14 kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, and nine of them are mentioned in documentation from outside Jewish sources. That's an incredible number, nine out of 14. And that lends a tremendous amount of credibility to the at least general scope of the biblical narrative. And we'll look at a couple of examples of that. But let's go into the historical period itself. So Solomon... Uh, as king, as we discussed in the last lecture, you know, expands the and consolidates his control over the land of Israel, uh, building on the conquests of his father, King David, and cementing it really with a lot of statesman craft by, you know, engaging in diplomatic relations with a lot of the kingdoms surrounding the land of Israel. Uh, he also centralizes ritual worship by building a massive, glorious temple in Jerusalem. However, what that means is inevitably taxes. There's a great tax burden that is placed on the Jewish people as a whole, and they resent the huge taxation. Under the wise leadership of King Solomon, there was just, you know, scattered grumblings. But once Solomon passes away and it goes to his son Rechavam, there is a tremendous amount of resentment that's built up over the heavy tax burden. Rechavam is really of two minds. Uh, he, on the one hand, you know, wants to react to the uh, popular pressure, but at the same time, he wants to maintain the fairly lavish lifestyle that he is accustomed to. And prodded by, unfortunately, as the text mentions, younger, inexperienced members, rather than the steady guiding hand of his older ministers that served under his father, Rechavam, in a very dismissive manner, insists on pushing ahead with his heavy tax burden that the northern kingdom in particular is loath to accept. There is a very fascinating and powerful passage. And by the way, I want to reinforce that I'm just going to be skimming over the tops of the historical record as we find in the Bible. It is so important that you actually go back to the text and read the primary documents themselves because they are fantastic. And if you have a sense that, you know, it's going to be dry or boring, I just want to refer to you to one specific passage with Rechavah. Uh, it's shown here in this uh, 
wall painting in uh, Basel that's done by uh, the great Hans Holbein. Uh, you see that Rechavam here is portrayed with uh, holding out his little finger. And this is in reference to one highly dismissive and disrespectful remark that Rechavam makes regarding his father, in which he says that uh, Rechavam says that his own little finger, his pinky, is thicker than anything his father could bring to bear, meaning to dismissively compare himself with his father, the great King Solomon. And of course, this act of hubris and vulgarity really sends him down the rabbit hole, which will ultimately result in civil war. But I just wanted to point this one out because it's one of those passages that shows you that the biblical text is really you know, it's quite racy, and it has a lot of very powerful information in it that you don't get with sanitized translations quite often. Uh, the, well, let's not go any further down that scope. But let's go back to where we left off. So, under Yeravam ben Navat, the uh, kingdom of Israel, which is to the north of Jerusalem, splits away from what becomes the kingdom of Judah in the south. Yeravam ben Navat, by the way, receives a very, very bad press in the rest of Jewish tradition. He's considered uh, one of the greatest sinners because he introduced that divisiveness in Jewish politics of the time. Here's a map that shows you the relative locations of the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. Um, the capital of the kingdom of Judah is, of course, Jerusalem. The kingdom of Israel is in Samaria, or Shomron. In subsequent lectures, we'll speak much more about what happened to the people in the kingdom of Israel. They are the so-called ten lost tribes. More about that in a few lectures. Um, but it's interesting to note that it seems that they have a consciousness, they retain a consciousness of being one people, albeit separated politically, and uh, although they will fight a civil war and they will have ongoing conflict over the next century and a half, they'll also recognize the centrality of the value of worship in Jerusalem. They will also occasionally marry each other. The royalty of Israel and Judah will still intermarry. And although they have a lot of conflict, it seems to be really a family conflict. But more on that later. The civil war that erupts when Yeravim ben Navat breaks away uh, with the northern tribes is taken advantage of by Egypt, and King Shishak enters the, uh, the region, and he makes essentially this parade up the land of Israel, conquering cities as he goes and bringing Israel firmly within its larger sphere of influence, although Israel still maintains its, its identity. Israel and Judah, that is, maintain their identity as uh, independent principalities, but nevertheless falling within the geopolitical orbit of Egypt. Uh, this it, We've seen this in a couple of previous lectures because he left behind um, you know, these topographical lists of the various places he conquered. What's interesting for our point is that when he gets to the north, to Megiddo, uh, the site of a place known in English as Armageddon. It's actually a place in Israel, Megiddo. Uh, he left behind a stele that uh, is kind of like a shishak was here stele that, although it's badly damaged, it still retains its cartouche, the uh, sort of nameplate of uh, shishak, also pronounced shoshank, by the way, that... Um, that indicates that he did, in fact, uh, make his way through northern Israel. One of the most fascinating archaeological finds from the 9th century, however, that corroborates much of the biblical text uh, is this amazing find, the so-called Meshastili, also known as the Moabite stone. It was discovered in Dibon, which was in the kingdom of Moab, which is today, of course, uh, uh, Jordan, and it records from the Moabite perspective, the results of a very prolonged conflict between uh, the kingdom of Israel and the Moabites. And in fact, this is confirmed in the Book of Kings. There's a lot of discussion of various military uh, engagements they had, uh, which the Jews frequently lost. And here you have this interesting passage that's taken directly from the Moabite stone, in which Mesha, the author of the text, uh, son of Chemosh God, Chemosh, of course, being the name of their God, uh, complains about how badly he was treated in particular by the son of Omri, 
which is one of the Jewish kings. And the Omri dynasty was actually one of the most uh, important in the northern kingdoms, especially in terms of its military activity throughout the region. And he talks in this stele about how he beat back the invading Jews, and therefore he deserved to create this particular monument. It's a fascinating uh, stone. So much more to say about it, but in this brief series, we just want to quickly look at it. The Omri dynasty mentioned in the Moabite stone is uh, one of the most well-documented of the Northern Kingdom's dynasties. Now, during this period, when there is a separation between the Kingdom of Judah and the Kingdom of Israel, uh, we have recorded in the Bible some of those fascinating passages from two Northern prophets in particular, Elijah and Elisha. Um, the uh, the, the, the great miraculous activities of these prophets are among the most dramatic passages in the Bible, including a, a personal favorite of mine, the resuscitation of the son of the Shunammite woman, shown here in this remarkable 19th century painting by Jan Sluiters, where the, the mother is reunited with her son who has returned from death. A fascinating passage, definitely uh, worth uh, reading. However, we're, our task here is to approach the prophets as historical sources, and I want to comment on two specific aspects of the prophetic works as being uh, especially valuable. Let us recall that the text that is called by the Jews the Tanakh, uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, is made up of three distinct sections, which which have very, very distinct hermeneutic rules applied to them as well. The first five books are known as the Torah per se, although that term Torah is also used in a much larger sense, meaning any kind of religious teaching that pertains to the general values of Judaism. We'll talk about that more when we get to the rabbinic tradition in greater detail. But there's the first five books of Moses, which have a very high threshold of sanctity within Jewish theology. They are considered to be uh, dictated by God to Moses. Some uh, interesting discussion about what about the passages in which Moses describes his own death, but not for us here. We're looking primarily at the history. From the book of Joshua on, there's a large section called the Nevi'im, or Prophets, um, which is a mixture of materials, sometimes much more historical data, sometimes much more kind of ethical teachings. Um, and then finally, you have the section called Ketuvim, or Writings, which include things that really don't fit into either category, like uh, Psalms, for example, or Prophets, um, the... Um, the Song of Songs, uh, the Book of Esther fit in there, and so on. And uh, these second two sections, Nach, or Nevim and Ketuvim, the, the prophets and the writings, are considered to have a lower degree of sanctity to the first five books of Moses. Uh, they are clearly written by human beings and recognized, so not dictated by God, but perhaps inspired by God. The commentators were out different approaches to you know what they actually mean, what's their, so to speak, uh, nuclear weight in terms of uh, understanding you know, the uh, task of Judaism. But from a historical perspective, some of the prophetic works, like Kings and Chronicles in particular, seem to take upon themselves the, um, the task of pre preserving the historical record, much more so than other documents, such as, um, for example, Isaiah or Jeremiah, which have tremendous amounts of historical information, but seem to be much more focused on delivering the uh, prophetic message of repentance and, uh, you know, drawing closer to God. In Kings and Chronicles, there's even some uh, so to speak, kind of footnoting, where from time to no time, uh, the author of those texts, uh, by the way, the book of Kings is normally attributed in the rabbinic tradition to Jeremiah himself, which fits at least with the time period that we have. It's, it seems reasonable that it was written in the 6th century. Um, the, the book of Kings and Chronicles will refer to earlier texts, such as the annals of the kings of Judah, the annals of the kings of Israel, which implies that they've done research in terms of the, the record books of the, uh, 
the dynasties, they tend to be really focused on the leadership of the kingdom of Judah and the king of Israel, and they say a tremendous amount about the individual activities of this king or that king, often applying a very strict uh, moral and religious judgment to their activity as well. It's fascinating. Other prophets, however, uh, do not spend quite as much time talking about, you know, palace intrigue and wars and things like that, but spent a lot more time, you know, exclaiming a uh, an ethical and religious message. And so approaching these texts, one has to kind of tease out the historical information from some of the later prophets, and at the same time, understand the uh, the overwhelming religious goal of the more historically oriented prophets. In many cases, they offer us tempting, tantalizing historical data, um, and, and that's often confirmed by the archaeological record. For example, uh, there is the uh, horrendous queen Jezebel, or Izebel in Hebrew, and the archaeological record has found this remarkable cartouche here, which is a uh, uh, very... Uh, appropriate to have been uh, owned by a Phoenician woman, it has the same kind of symbols and things like that, whose name was Izevel. Now, it's, it's possible that it belonged to Queen Jezebel herself. Uh, it is very large and very expensive compared to similar uh, types of uh, these artifacts, but um, we have no real proof that this is specifically belonged to Queen Izebel and not to some other Izebel. But nevertheless, fascinating materials that generally point us along the same kind of direction as the biblical text offers. So returning to the historical narrative, uh, what happens in the northern kingdom is basically they come under the sphere of influence of the Assyrians. You recall that Israel is locked between two major geopolitical powers. To the south is the Kingdom of Egypt or the Egyptian Empire, and to the north is, at this point, the Assyrian Empire, later the Babylonian Empire that it overlaps. And Israel, being of the northern part of the dual monarchy, Israel feels the threat of Assyria more powerfully. The Assyrian Empire expands in the ninth century and begins to impact the northern part of the land of Israel and place the local kings in a state of vassalage. Um, this vassalage begins in the year 853, and we see, for example, with King Yehu, who is shown here showing obeisance to King Shalmaneser. This is uh, from the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser that we discussed in, I think, the third lecture or so of this series. Uh, and the, the northern kings of Israel are heavily burdened by additional tribute and taxes that uh, come from the north. Uh, eventually, as we shall discuss a few lectures from now, the Assyrians will simply say, well, that's it for their independence. It's too much of a hassle. They're too rebellious. And uh, the Assyrians will come and take over the northern section, uh, take over the kingdom of Israel. And that's when we talk about the lost 10 tribes. Um, We'll return to that, but for the next couple of lectures, I'd like to take a break from the sort of political narrative of history, and I'd like to look at the daily life in biblical history. We're going to look at the, uh, the economic, uh, the social, and the familial, and the ritual life of Jews for a few lectures, and then we'll return to a discussion of Israel under Assyria. Thank you very much for watching.